look over this group again, they're pretty divided in, in two, I think, and uh, it makes what I want to do a little bit challenging, and I want to suggest that we It's a group here who know a heck of a lot more about working on these issues and analyzing these issues and discussing these issues than I do. We had a lot more experience, and you can look around the room and see who those people are. And there's a group of people who may be relatively new to this, um, if not totally new. Here's what I'd like to do when I, when I talk about this. I'd like to have those of you who see yourself as relatively new to this think about this as a lesson, not a lesson you have to accept. Yeah. And the rest of you think about it as much as, am I doing a good job teaching those people the lesson? Okay, so that you become mentors, whatever, along with me. Uh, and everything else, so that that way we can we can discuss both my ideas from your perspective and, and from the perspective of people who are new. Um, I just heard a statistic on the, on the way down here that I wanted to toss in there, uh, and that is that this is on NPR. That one of the great things about NPR, as in Google, is that you can always pick up stuff at the last minute that you can stick into the talk. So this one's somewhere stuck. I don't know the Wilder app, and someone in the Wilder app, and off ramp came on it. 1% of the 1% of the most wealthy people in New York, right? yeah. uh, <laughs> in the U.S. give 25% of the campaign funds. Now, you're imagining something there uh, that is uh, goes anywhere from spectacular to grotesque. And I don't want to disabuse you of that imagination, but I think there's something else about money and influence that I want to explore with you. because. Those kinds of big, spectacular kinds of things about money going to, to political campaigns and so on is just part of what influence is about. And I would argue that those of you who are doing grassroots stuff and going in need to know a whole lot more about it than that. We'll get to that in a second. So here's what I want to do very quickly. I want to talk about three things. As you go forward and develop political tools, tools that you want to use, say, in the legislature, I say you need to know three, you need to know three general things. One is how influence works. Influence is about lobbying, it's about money, but it's about a lot more than that. You've got to understand how influence works. The second is what are some of the issues that are likely to be important in the next legislature here, in the next session of the legislature. And the third thing is what you are, what you as individuals and members of groups are. So I want to take each one of those and run through them pretty quickly to get some kind of sense of what it's, what it's like trying to work in a political system like ours. So let's start with influence. I mean, we could all think of an example of outrageous, big time kinds of lots of money. It's easy to get. I mean, Dickie just gave some examples where um, it, it, it's, it's totally outrageous. But I want to point out that there's a lot of ways that influence works that may be, at some level, just as outrageous, but is not really as visible. I mean, we know that big money can influence, goes into elections and, and can influence elections. We know that big money has been very much involved, let's say, in funding the Tea Party movement. The Tea Party movement is at one level a kind of inchoate grassroots movement that came together, but it got an enormous amount of money so far, so very rich people. As, as we understand now. Uh, we know that public opinion can be influenced by the amount of promotions that big money can make. But I, but, and, and, but I, and we know that there are some issues here in which big money is clearly involved. It's interesting how many of them right now are city and county issues, I think, and, and uh, that's maybe a coincidence, maybe not. Uh, development issues in Eva and Kakaako and the North Shore, rail, those are issues where you say, aha, we can see where people with lots of money and lots of influence can you know, work. And so if you, if, and if you really want to look at how money, old school political influence, polluted the political process and economic development in Hawaii, just go and read Dawes and Cooper's Land and Power in Hawaii. It's a little dated now, but it'll make you laugh, it'll make you cry. If you want to see outrage, if you want to see good old fashioned greasing palm special influence, special knowledge, that's where you go. Uh, I'm not saying it's gone away, but I'm saying it, that, that, that's, a, that's an example. But it is an exceptional example. That is, I'm not saying that the rest of the political system is good. I'm saying the kinds of things that you're likely to run up against, the kinds of things you need to understand, 
are not quite that spectacular. And I want the example I want to give that she asked me to give to said basically what she said to me is find an example where people really get screwed and talk about it. Well I don't <laughs> that is, so I she's you know she's a Stanford graduate, she's language is better than that. But that's but it's what what I want to do is to take a, a huge example right that's happening right now at the federal level that is really huge and that shows influence, but not quite in the way of quid pro quos or greasing palms anything like that. That example is the, the battle that's going on in, in Washington right now uh, over for-profit colleges. For-profit colleges. Um, for-profit colleges have a, um, have a huge stake. These, we're talking about Phoenix, we're talking about the others. There's been a lot of complaints about them in the sense that they don't graduate many people. They take all this federal student loan money, the students don't graduate, they get to keep the money. The students own a lot of stuff. So President Obama said, we're going to make rules, administrative rules that's going to make it much harder for uh, students to get loans to go to these schools or to make, the, make these schools require a lot more. The organizations of the for-profit colleges just got finished spending, this, this is according to the New York Times, $16 million. $16 million in a successful effort to water down um, these rules that the Obama administration promised to make. And I want to take a closer look at this process because it isn't just the money. The money doesn't Money is, a, is a, a material thing. It's a resource. Someone has to know how to use the resource. And what did the resource do? And I think there's some really interesting lessons here. Who, where did this money go to? First of all, there was an enormous amount of lobbying that went on. Who did the lobbying? Former members of the Obama administration. Former members of the Obama administration, including his former communications director, and some big wig Democrats like Dick Depard. They, they were the ones that a lot of this money went to people who had close ties, and I'll get back to why that's important, close ties already with the administration that was trying to change these rules. There were two dozen meetings uh, with members of these kinds of organizations in the White House or within the, in the Department of Education divisions. One of the people who is, was active in lobbying and trying to influence the Obama administration was the founder of Phoenix University. Even though that stock has gone into the tank a bit, this guy is still pretty rich. He's a close friend of Nancy Pelosi. Now, what am I trying to illustrate here? One of, one of the th I'm trying to illustrate two things that you need to understand, and one of which is that influence works not just through money, but through the establishment of long-standing networks of like-minded people. And you get access to these long-standing networks of like-minded people by being, to some extent, wealthy, to some extent, part of the process already, to some extent, having a, a, a direct interest in it, and, and, and to some extent, thinking along the same lines as these people that you're trying to influence. So that, so that you already have a place to go. You already have a sense that you can accomplish something. You know who to call, and you have the money to do it. The money isn't, isn't, isn't the only thing. The second thing to understand is that this does not necessarily involve a highly visible process. This is about changing administrative rules. And a lot of politics is done, certainly at the federal level, and to some extent at the state level, at a rule-making, not very highly visible level. Now, it, it's visible maybe in the sense that, there, that the public meetings have to be announced and all of that, but they involve technical decisions where, or, or decisions that, that uh, affect certain people in very different sort of ways. But you've got to know about You've got to know how to operate in that kind of situation. This was about affecting a rulemaking portion of the Department of Education, um, particularly one of the law office. Now, the guy who runs that office, an extraordinarily bright law professor named Cass Sunstein, said none of this lobbying, had he didn't call it lobbying, had anything to do with the process. It didn't affect us at all. Somebody who works in his office said this is the most heavy politicking I've ever seen. But I think the important thing is take Cass Sunstein at his word for a second, and you'll understand 
more about the process than if you just label it as sucking up or passing money around and so on. What Cass Sunstein was, one of the ways to think about the process is to say, well, yeah, maybe there do need to be so much heavy handedness here because these people know how to talk to one another. That, that these are like-minded people who had a difference on this kind of opinion, and so when they went in to talk, talk about it, they had the access, they had the ability, they, had, they were well represented. And I think that's another kind of lesson that you have to learn, that these things happen in an isolated place, you're fighting against long-standing uh, networks. Now, you think about the Hawaii legislature. The Hawaii legislature, as, as uh, folks just suggested, is a very accessible place. During the legislative session, there are so many people down there that you start saying, why are they all here? What's going on here? I mean, it, it's, it's Bebba, and it really is a pretty open place. But it's more open in the way that I'm talking about here to, to, uh, to some than it is to others. That is, if you are an experienced, influential person, if you are a lobbyist, it's not so much about buying gifts or, or the quick pro quo. Sure, money is important. It's about having that place to talk to, having somebody's ear, having somebody's trust. Now, I don't want to, don't get me wrong, I'm not here trying to make nice nice about money in politics, not for me. But what I'm trying to suggest to you is that you can't simply be outraged by the money, because it's this process that you're trying to break into. If you got money, you can do it a lot easier than if you don't have money, for sure. It's there, and, 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 uh, and, and you have to be able to work with it. So that's, uh, that's the, first, the, the first thing that, that, I, that I wanted to say. Now, um, so any other lessons? OK, money obviously helps, but money is just a resource. And, and the example I want to give for that is that one of the more powerful lobbying organizations in this state, one of the more influential organizations in this state, look at the last session, is not some kind of hard-drinking, gift-giving, cigar-smoking, glad-handing uh, organization. It's the American Association for Retired People, which both nationally and here is an extraordinarily successful uh, uh, interest group. Uh, and you could call it a special interest group. Now, that term has a has a pejorative cast to it, but it is a group that represents its interest in the same way that everybody else does. I'll, I'll come, back, come back to that in a second. Issues, now here it's talking about what kind of issues do you have to think about? Well, you all have your own issues here, but I was thinking, well, what, are we, what can we say about the 2012 legislature and what's likely to happen? I, I say the same thing about, first of all, before I look at some specific issues very quickly, I say the same thing about 2012 that I said about 2011. Budget, budget, budget. That that the, the fiscal exigency, the fiscal crisis in this state colors everything else as it does across the country. I mean, nationally, we see the same trends that we that we've started to see here. That is, nationally, as the money allocated for education goes down, which it has, the amount of money for uh, medical services for healthcare goes up in terms of state allocations. So you know that in a, in a the, the budget situation is so dire here that it in fact can touch any kind of issue. Now, with that in mind, I just want to suggest that there are three three categories of issues that I want to mention. One is a safety net issue. I'll just come back to that. What do I mean by that? The second one that legislators have really started talking about already is uh, education. There's going to be a lot of ferment about education. Uh, the the pre-K, are we finally going to have the kindergarten program that's been delayed, charter schools, uh, changing the operation and, and uh, firming up the operation of the Board of Education. We don't think about these as much as big player issues, but there's, there was virtually no competition for uh, school bus uh, bids. The price of school buses, the, 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 the bids went way up high. It, it appears that there's an oligopoly. Now, there's a couple of things that are going to happen. Some mainland companies are saying, hey, you know what, we're going to step in, so maybe the market will take care of it. But there's also a concern by the legislature, and, and because they don't think that the Board of Education or the DOE's handle this very well, that, that, that that's going to be an issue. But I think education generally, um, and education gets related to long-term budget stuff, because people talk about human capital, the need to educate 
the citizens of Hawaii so that they can work in an economy that's going to be developed. And we know something about pre-K and the importance of early education to make that happen. A, uh, a second issue is pension funds. Um, we have a huge unfunded liability. Um, and again, this is an interesting kind of issue because are we going to fund the pensions that are going to allow for me to keep collecting the fat amount of money I collect every month, thanks to you, now that I'm retired, uh, living off the fat of the land? Um, but, so I've got a special interest. In it. So, so remember in the last session when Governor Abercrombie tried to do some things about pension, he did some, he was able to make the legislature make some changes. But remember the one that he wanted to change? This is not so much your pension report, this is revenue. I'm going to get back to the pension report in a second. He wanted to tax the pensions. And, and um, he was not successful in doing it. The legislature didn't want to go along with it. I don't think that this was an issue where the fat cats were concerned. The AARP was very successful here. Why were they successful? Part of the reason they were successful is they, they've already established patterns for what it was. Another reason is that old people vote. Uh, I'll get back to what James said before about uh, about youth and voting because I have a slightly different cut on it. I, I, and, uh, but but they vote. Um, the other thing is that there is an image. I was listening to what some of the legislators said about why they didn't go along with this. There is a, a well-crafted image uh, that you that the old are kind of homogeneously poor and deserve to get the money, or uh, and that it, it would be a discourtesy to those of us who are elders now to be able to come back. Now, I don't want to get into an argument about whether how accurate that image is, but I do want to say that they've been very successful in, in carrying out it. It's, it's a, a, a mass organization. So you're going to have um, you're going to have the AUP in, in on these, I mean, the, the AARP in on this kind of issue. You're certainly going to have the civil service unions in on this on some of these issues. But the big issue here is, are we going to take money in a very tight economy with a very tight budget uh, where the attempt to do short-term stuff is so strong and allocate the money that has been deferred for so long into, into the uh, funding for pensions? And that's a classic regular problem. And, and in good times, legislators all through the country have dealt with it by just Deferring, saying, well, we worry about that when the time comes. Time is come. And so that's going to be an issue. The safety net, I, I don't want to demean any one issue here of the safety net, but I think I, what I mean by the safety net is that there's a whole bunch of social welfare issues that are going to come up again because if the budget is in a serious enough situation, we're going to have to start thinking about cutting things that have already been cut that involve vulnerable people, people who cannot always advocate for themselves. Um, and um, sometimes they can't advocate for themselves because they, they don't have the interest in the ability, but sometimes they simply can't. If you're a, if, if you're a uh, person with a severe uh, 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 mental disability, if you're a frail elderly, um, if you're a poor person, a single, uh, a single parent, working 40 or 50 hours a week, 60 hours a week, or maybe isn't working at all, but has to take care of your kids at home. It's very hard for those people, if not impossible, to participate in the political process. That raises another kind of issue. Who advocates for it? Who, who's going to step forward and do it? And this is always a problem. This is not a, we're not callous people here, and this is clearly not a callous state. But in the din, in, in, the, in the push to do uh, to, to allocate resources, you are much better off if an organization like the AARP, and I'm just using them to kind of disorient you. I don't, I'm certainly not trying to, to stigmatize them to do that. Or a, a labor union, or the Chamber of Commerce, or the Hawaiian Visitors Association. If you are part of their constituency, and to some extent they're accountable to you, you're in a much better place than if you're in a uh, an old in a, an assisted living place, or you're in a, you're a student special ed. So those are those things. So in other words, there are people who are very much not like you that are that are going to be affected in this process. Which brings me to my final point: you need to know who you are. And 
I, what I want you to, what I want to think about if you think about it in this sense is that you and this group are exceptional people. And I mean that both as a compliment and as a warning. And and here's how you're exceptional. First of all, you're exceptional by being in this group. And and the three folks that got introduced are exceptional because unlike most of the people your age, although you're kind of getting I Well, James, too. I've known James yeah, since he was an undergraduate. Uh, last, <laughs> said, last millennium? <laughs> <laughs> when was it? I don't even remember anything. But of course, I'm not expected to remember anything. Uh, but you're, you're exceptional in the sense that look at the age of the people in this room for the most part. This is a disproportionately older crowd compared to the population. And you're exceptional in that way. You're exceptional in some very good ways. It's most, in this state, it's hard to get people to vote. Voting, and voting is a minimal democratic act. Well, how you're exceptional is you're willing to move your body, literally, to move your body, to take action. Um, so that, in, in addition, that you still have a belief in your ability to affect the political system. You know, it's interesting, if you sit on, if you sit on Common Cause, or you listen to people talk about you know, good government people, and I consider myself a good government person, if we sit around and talking about Citizens United and PACs and all of this kind of money and the 1%, we wouldn't be talking about it in the way we do if we didn't think there was some kind of way to change it. If there wasn't at least in our core, in our, you know, in, 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 uh, in our hearts, uh, some belief that we could change the system. You're not cynical. You're not apathetic. And that makes you different. You have a continuing interest in politics, and that really makes you different. The average person gets mobilized at certain times, usually around elections. But for the most part, his or her um, interest in politics, it, it's, it's intermittent. So you help make democracy work uh, because voting is just a minimum qualification for, the, for successful democracy. It takes much more than that to make access work and to make accountability both work. Anybody who believes that a legislator is simply accountable because you can vote them out of office is naive. First of all, we don't vote people out of office. We stick with incumbents. We do. I mean, that's that's the case. So there is other there are other ways that we try to hold people accountable, and a lot of the good government stuff is about that. But the warning is this: you will be working with and trying to influence people who are not exceptional in the way you are, who are different from you, who are more ordinary. Who, and I don't mean that in a bad way, and, and I don't, certainly don't want to seem more normal, but uh, their, their interest in politics comes and goes. Their passion may not be your passion. They may not, may not have passion at all. Their link to the political system, something that you take for granted, that, polit that you can see your life in terms of politics. I don't mean as a career, but you can think of a thing like building developing uh, properties, let's say, in EVA, in terms of a political process. Many, many people don't think that way, and most people don't think that way regularly. Politics isn't, isn't that much a part of their life. So when you have to remember that, because certain things can happen, and this is a warning here, you can begin to become cynical yourself. You can start to harangue people because they're not like you. Um, and let me, voter turnout is a great example. Everything that, I, I, I can say this without, every editorial that ever appears about high voter turnout sounds to me like they're trying to get you to quit smoking. I mean, there is, there is no evidence at all that um, trying to convince people to vote because that makes them good citizens has any effect. It, it doesn't. I mean, voter turnout, increasing voter turnout, as, as uh, Rock the Vote has found out a number of times, it's very hard. One, because it's hard to get people to turn up. But the more important thing, and this is where James, what James said comes in, it's hard to get people to stay with the process if you're young. I my cut on the, on the 2008 election in 2010. 2008 is exceptional. You start with the assumption that people who are young, young voters, let's say, let's say 18 to 25, really are not typically very interested in politics. 
The reason they got interested in 2008 is to some extent the president, the can presidential candidate, and Obama's charisma. But don't kid yourself. Char charisma was just part of it. The other part of it was the most extraordinarily well-funded and the most extraordinarily politically sophisticated campaign that has ever been run in American history. It is so good that the Republicans are, of course, trying to copy it now, just as Democrats learned to copy the, some of the Republican uh, development in voter uh, data uh, a few years ago. So you have to assume that a person, a, a young person, is not going to be all that interested in it. And that doesn't mean you have to accept it. But you, if you see that person as brisk, if you see that person as lazy, if you see that person um, as as, my third, as as James suggested, I mean, he, he called it one thing, but then he suggested something else. It's sort of rational. In, 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 these people are not yet connected with politics. Their lives are not political lives. My life is a political life because I, for a lot of, well, one, I'm a political scientist, so it better be. Right? Now I don't have to do about it anymore, except for good opportunities like this. But, but the, the fact of the matter is that we can think of policies that affect our lives and we think of ways of changing them. You can't take that, you can't take it for granted. So one of the things that you may always have to keep in mind is this. You spend a lot of time with people who are like you. Part of the essence of your political organizing is bringing like-minded people on. But the real challenge is to remember that there are many people that you're going to have to influence one way or the other who are not very like-minded. And I don't have time to do this, but I just want to, to, to really look at it closely. But I want to end by just pointing out to you something. You want to think about politics. You want to think about how you move from a, a few interested people to something else. Think about three movements that have been very important in American politics in just the last couple of years. One took place here. One all here. One took place partially here, and one took place um, what took place hardly here at all. Uh, the one that took place here is the Save Our Schools movement, SOS. SOS found itself in a very interesting position in regard to furloughs, where it moved from an organization, and it was, it was around, but it moved into an organization where it began to think about other ways of influencing public opinion as well as making decisions, and they ended up doing some sittings. They did some of their politics that way. The Tea Party had another kind of pattern uh, on, on how they did it and the other kinds of choices that they made. So, and and um, the third issue is the Occupy movement, whether it's Occupy Hawaii or Occupy any of the other ones. How do they move, if at all, how are they trying to move from a kind of mass to something that has more influence? You, you, it's, it's tempting just to stay among yourselves and and make your decisions that way, and try to do your strategy that way. But often in the life of politics, if you think about these issues, you're going to have to move outside, and I just want you to think about it. OK, that's pretty much it. I, I, I guess what I'm trying to say, I used to tell my students this all the time. If I can convince you that, that a path to understanding about what you're trying to do in politics goes something like this, <coughs> politics are more complex than you think. But that should have bolded you. Uh, that should have bolded you by making you Look hard luck. And those of you who help me teach, let me know what I <laughs>